Okay, I think we're ready to get going. So welcome everyone. And it's amazing to see so many people from so many different places around the country and beyond. Um, we're here tonight with kicking off our first session of Courageous Conversations About Race. And um, myself and Amjad are co-founders of the Baymed Network. There's six of us on the National Steering Group. And we're delighted to welcome Professor Paul Miller this evening, who's going to be leading, leading the way on our first conversation. Professor Paul Miller is Professor of Educational Leadership and Social Justice and president of the Commonwealth Council for Educational Administration and Management. And if it's very fitting now for Black History Month because Professor Paul Miller is the first and only black professor of educational leadership in the whole of the UK. So he's making history right here and now. And the structure of the session tonight um, is that we will have an input to guide us from Paul Miller. And then we will move to uh, being in conversation. So we'll be asking questions. So throughout his talk, if you have questions, do pop them in the chat and we will pick those up and we will try to condense our questions into um, sort of trying to pick up all of the different themes that you have mentioned in your own questions in the chat. So I hope that all makes sense. Over to you. Thank you, Penny. And thank you, Amjad, and thank you, Bemed, for inviting me to be part of your series. And thank you, colleagues, for joining this conversation this evening from wherever you are joining. So I, I've been asked to reflect on this issue of taking an audit and also setting the strategy to become an anti-racist institution. And uh, I'm going to get straight into what I think are some of the things we need to be thinking around. Um, because I know we have a limited time to talk about such an important thing this afternoon. So my first slide here says it, you know, towards an anti-racism strategy. Um, it is not a sprint. It's, it's definitely um, one of those long distance races. So it's really, really important for us to establish from the get go that it's not a sprint. It's a, it's a considered process. It's an iterative process. Um, and therefore it's important to go slow and steady and try to get it right or more aspects of it right rather than trying to to delve in and, and um, compound existing problems. Um, I put here as well, begin with or link to an overarching EDI strategy. I think it's really important that as part of any anti-racism strategy that this is grounded in or certainly anchored to or aligned with an overarching EDI strategy. In other words, if as an institution, you are going to be setting up an anti-racist strategy, then you need to link this to your, your EDI strategy. And if you don't have an EDI strategy, then perhaps you need to develop an EDI strategy. And then from that, you can build out your anti-racism strategy. But it's important that there is an interlocking relationship between those two. So, in terms of this whole process, as I see it, um, I, I see this work of setting up this anti-racism strategy as comprising three parts. 
One, I see the phase one, which I've described here as the scoping and contextualizing, which is the auditing phase. And phase two, which is the prioritizing and action planning phase, which I've called action. And phase three, the accountability, sustainability and impact, which I call here assurance and assessment. So I've sort of presented this in a way that it makes sense so that you can see the process. It's perhaps not linear, but rather iterative. Um, so it's important not to see it as a linear process, but, but a process which feeds into, but also can wrap around at different parts. What do I mean by phase one? What goes into phase one, for example, this audit phase? Now this audit phase is really important because it is listening to voices, you know, identifying and evidences, evidencing the voices. So when I'm working with schools and other institutions, I ask them to do an audit. Who is in my school? And by who is in my school, I'm saying, have you considered your staff? And have you considered your students? And that is, that is all staff, not only teaching staff, but all staff, who is in my school? And it's really important that school leaders, educational leaders get kind of granular with this kind of detail, find out. There is a, there is a, a person behind that number. There is a personality, a history, a story, and it's important that we identify that person, that history, that story, who is in my school. So knowing the people who are in your school in terms of your students and also your staff. In addition to that, look at their positions and status. Um, so for example, do BME staff occupy lower roles compared with white staff? What about our learners? Do we see that the rate for exclusion, whether temporarily or permanent exclusion, is higher among certain groups? Positions and status within the organizations. Who are the ones who are at the brunt of the disciplinary? Who are the brunt, who, who are the ones who um, are not represented in top positions and so on? So we need to also audit that look at positions and status within the organization. In other words, look at how people are treated within the organization and positioned within the organization. And then the lived experiences. And it's really, really important that in addition to looking at who is in my school, we are, we are interviewing people and asking them how they experience their organizations. It's really important because we need to hear it from their voices. We need to hear their own stories of how their organizations make them feel, whether it's our students, the curricula, or whether it's the processes and policies within our organizations, the disciplinary processes, the teaching and learning policies, or whether it's staff, the progression policies, the disciplinary policies, and so on and so forth. But we need to hear their lived experiences. So, to simply do it on a technical checklist of who is in my school or a technical checklist of who, you know, positions and status is one thing, but we need to, to get down into the, the sort of deep lived experiences of um, these individuals. The second part of this um, scoping and contextualizing exercise is about reviewing policies and practices. It's really important that we take a long, deep, look at our policies within organizations. I sort of alluded to that earlier, the HR policies such as recruitment, where are we recruiting and what is coming through in terms of applications. But even before we think about recruiting, what are, there is a bit of work that needs to be done, which is around attracting candidates to, to, to our organization. So where are we advertising and What's the language of the advert? What is our website saying about us? And so on. So there's an attracting bit of work that needs to take place even before we can start the work of recruiting. And progression, we need to look at our policies 
Do these policies cause harm to people or are they equitable? Um, do they need to be revised and so on? Similarly, the EDI policy, is there one? Do we need to review it? Is it inclusive enough? Or do we need to actually build out one because we haven't got one in place at the moment? Look at our grievance numbers. Um, look at committee structures and committee memberships and so on. Who is in positions? Who's joining these commi committees? Who chair these committees? And so on. So we have to really look at our HR policies and practices and, uh, and, and, and see how these, again, the position and status of individuals within organizations. Look at other policies, anti-bullying policies, inclusion policies, and whether these policies are at odds with the anti-racist policy or whether these can be strengthened by having an anti-racist policy. But essentially, the whole work around this agenda calls for a timely review of all policies that are trying to tackle othering at the same time. So it's really important that that is understood. And then we need to be looking at recorded incidents and data sets. So have we been capturing complaints? Have we been capturing any, any issues that have arisen? We need to, what do we do with this, this, this incident log or this data set? So we need to look at our pay gaps, our exclusion data, our grievance data, our disciplinary data, and so on and so forth. Every organization is different. And therefore, this kind of contextualizing is really, really important. But as we know, that context shapes leadership and leadership shapes context. So it's really important for us to understand that no two school contexts are alike. And therefore it's, it's important that each school does these things in its own way, um, based on where it is at on its own journey. But it's really important, as I said, to remember that leadership shapes context and context shapes leadership. We need to think about our curriculum because that's about our students, um, the material, that, that they are studying the resources, the assessment, and so on. Audit all of these things. And this is the audit phase of the work, which is the contextualizing and the scoping. The second phase, which I alluded to earlier, is the action phase, which is about the prioritizing, action planning, and implementation. A lot of people sometimes jump to phase two without properly thinking about phase one. And it's really important, as I said, that we think very carefully about evidencing and contextualizing the problems or the issues before we, we jump to try to solve them because it's not a sprint. So we need to establish priorities. So getting all of that evidence from phase one, first thing we need to do is to establish our priorities. We cannot do everything at the same time. It's impossible. And we must base the priorities on evidence. And as I said here, pace the work. It's really important that we see this work as not a work that can be fixed overnight. There might be some things which can be done rather quickly, but serious anti-racism work is going to take a long time and I've, I've been encouraging organizations to think about 18 months, two years, sometimes even longer, but build out an action plan that is manageable for you as an organization. Again, thinking about your own context, but also pacing the work so that you have a better chance of doing a good job at what you're trying to achieve. So again, consider separate work packages, meaning you may need to think about, for example, a piece of work, just reviewing all of your policies and your data sets as one piece of work. You may need to think about another piece of work around staffing, and that's a separate piece of work and another piece of work around the curriculum. And so you have separate work packages which can be staged over time. So plan for action. You move from that and you plan for action, and so you look at your timelines, but importantly, what's your success measure? If you're, if you're going to be investing in this work and you're going to be investing in this work, um, you know, money and time and so on, 
and it's going to mean something. It's going to mean something for the people um, whose lives you're trying to, to impact positively and for the organizational culture and climate which you're trying to, to, to build, then there has to be some kind of success measure. So it's really important that a success measure, what is your desired future for the organization? Be thought through. Identify key actors, internal and external, really, really important from the get-go. You need to identify the people, whether internal or external to your organization or both, who can help you to, to think through your ideas um, in making sure that you know, you might not be missing important things. And it's really important that you have a broad base coalition, you know, looking at this kind of work um, because it's important we're thinking about parents and learners, the community actors and so on. And if we're doing anti-racism work, then it's important to think about BME people at the table because they have those lived experiences. And again, funding. You know, a lot of people are trying to fix this, this problem on the cheap. This problem cannot be fixed overnight and therefore it cannot be fixed on the cheap. So we have to identify a funding stream and other resourcing requirement because it's really important to think about very carefully what we can do. And that's why prioritizing the work is important. And here we talk about converting actions to meaningful deliverables. Again. It's, it's, it, there's a lot of goodwill out there, but it's actually trying to do what works within your context, but also within your budget, with the stakeholders that you've got, with your institutional context and so on. There's no point in you trying to do everything one time and end up doing uh, very little in the end or achieving very little in the end. The third element is this um, really important phase of assurance and assessment. And this is speaking to accountability. The actual, you know, keeping track and evaluation, but also the embedding of the actions and the outcomes and the standards and the systems within the organization. So we have done our audit, we have begun the process. Now, how do we make sure that this process delivers? And how do we make sure that this um, process um, is, is retained and it, it's people benefit from, from this process? And the organization's investment is, is, is um, you know, bear fruits and, 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 and has some outcomes um, for those that this was intended to benefit. So we make sure that actions and outcomes are matched. You know, so again, what is our desired future? And we think about the actions we need to take and we take those actions as far as is possible. But we can't take one set of actions that do not match up to those expected outcomes and to get the kinds of expected outcomes that we want. So. That is why it's important that the funding is important and the right people are at the table um, having the conversations and so on. And then I said, put EDI and anti-racism on meeting agendas as a standing item. This is really important. It's really, really, really important. You see, we have to bring race out of the shadows and we have to bring EDI out of the shadows. In many of our organizations, our schools, EDI is not on, um, the standing order of many meetings, nor is anti-racism. And I am putting it to you that we should be bringing them both out of the shadows. So where EDI already exists as a standing item on meeting agendas, wonderful. But we also need to be putting anti-racism on that agenda as well as a standing item. So everybody knows it's there and you can't miss it. Consider external support for evaluation of interventions. It's really important that, you know, I, I know that a lot of people are doing a lot of good work around this, this, this area, this issue, but how is this work being evaluated? 
a lot of people haven't even thought about how to evaluate the work. And so it's really important to think about how you will evaluate the work, again, your success criteria, but bring in external people, um, researchers and, and implementation specialists, you know, to help you look at this work. Importantly, acknowledge where more work is needed. You know, it's not a crime to say, you know, more work needs to be, to be done in this area. Or again, if we think about pacing the work, this year our focus is going to be on the curricula and then next year it is going to be on policies and then the following year is going to be on staffing or whatever order, you know. But it's really important to, to acknowledge that um, more work needs to be done, where work, more work needs to be done. And again, thinking about the ownership of this issue. If we are going to try to create a no opt-out culture, then we have to take people along with us. And so I argue that we need to, to you know, create these two important groups, an employee resource group or an, an anti-racism action group. And this employee resource group or, or anti-racism action group should include champions, white people, BME people, um, perhaps parents, perhaps learners who have a vested interest in this activity and who can support and manage the, the operationalization of the, 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 the action plan. You know, so it's really, really important that this is not be seen as, oh, well, it's a black people problem and therefore they are the ones who need to manage to be part of this group. But, you know, tackling racism is a collective endeavor. So it's really important that that culture of we are all in together or this new opt-out culture be created from the get-go. And establish a leaders and governors monitoring, monitoring and evaluation group. And that is really important because, you know, the employees resource group looks at the operational aspects of the plan, but the leaders and governors monitoring and evaluation group is the one that deals with the funding and oversight. And it's really, really important because we know that if leaders are not bought into this thing, then it's not going to go anywhere at all. So the leaders need to be on board and that's a part of the accountability regimen. And then another part linked to that is this sustainability um, issue. You know, we have to build out actions from each intervention. There's no point in us, you know, in you as an organization, inviting somebody to come in doing a couple of seminars that you're paying money for, and then don't use the opportunity to build out some actions. And that's the way you get people to own the activities. But that is how, again, you start to tackle some of the issues. So if you are going to organize a seminar around cultural competence, or if you're going to organize a seminar for staff around the inclusive curriculum framework, then every such activity you do, you should be getting members of your team to build out individual actions or groups within your school, you know, the history department, the English department, and so on and so forth, or the subject teams, if you're in a university or a college, to be able to build out actions from each of the intervention. Otherwise, then, you know, your, your, your impact is perhaps not going to be um, as you would have liked because, all right, it was only a two-hour seminar and that's it and job done, tick, you know. Then again, consider EDI and anti-racism as a target for all staff, as a performance target for all staff. And this is really, really important. You know, if we keep leaving EDI and anti-racism as a matter of conscience and goodwill, then we are going to miss too many people. So it's really important that leaders begin to think seriously about making EDI and anti-racism a performance target for every single staff, whether you're the cook or you're the cleaner or you're the chief executive or you're the head teacher or whatever position you hold within the organization. This kind of collective endeavor, this no opt-out culture is really going to be crucial to the sustainability and the impact of any intervention that we build out from an anti-racism strategy. Again, change course, speed up, slow down, 
take out, put in as necessary in line with new evidence and circumstances. We can't be so intransigent. We can't be so silly that we are so glued, so wedded to our plan that we don't realize that in light of new evidence or in light of new circumstances, we may need to tweak things or we may need to take things out altogether or add in new things and so on. So it's really important. It's about intelligent accountability is what I'm saying here. Again, we have to think about a communications plan. Ensure frequent and, con and consistent messages to stakeholders. Again, a lot of good work is happening in organizations, but this work is not being communicated to, to the stakeholders. And so sometimes we see staff get frustrated, students get frustrated, and so on. It's really important for and parents to communicate and be consistent, positive, inclusive message. But you know, think about um, making sure that people are aware of what you're doing and use different ways of engaging them, whether it's through online meetings or or face-to-face -face meetings or when these are allowable and or letters and so on but it's really important that the message is consistent and you know you're sharing the wins and the progress against any actions because people want to know that they are heard and that they are valued and that you are doing something because you care you know because teaching and leading is an ethic of care and people want to know that you care um review and ensure adequate funding is important again the funding thing you know so Again, this sits with the leadership and governors monitoring group, but it means that, you know, they need to be thinking whether the money that was committed early on can do or whether it can't do and whether there needs to be some different arrangements in terms of who are involved and, and whether you have experts from outside and so on. And I said here, document and celebrate and share success. There isn't a lot out there in terms of the published literature around what organizations are doing. And I think, I think it's so important that organizations begin to document what they're doing and work with academics, um, researchers, to help them to scale up um, some of this work so that it is in the public domain, you know, because if, if only the people within the organizations are knowing about this work, then really um, it's not selling the work in its full light and, and it's not, you know, um, sharing the full impact of the work. So I think it's really important that there's a plan as well to document and to share this work and to scale it up to other parts of the organization and, and to, um, you know, other units or to other processes and so on. So the, the, the way I see it, colleagues, is that um, this strategy has these three elements, an auditing element, which is phase one, which is about scoping and contextualizing. And then it has a second element there, which is about prioritizing action planning and implementation of that plan. And then it is about the accountability and the sustainability of that impact. So that is the assurance and the assessment. So that is what colleagues, I feel that I would want to put forward as an approach to tackling um, racism or to develop an anti-racism strategy and practice within our organizations. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, so much to take in in such a short amount of time. Really, really useful. Um, the phrase that I often like to use whenever talking about EDI kind of conversations is this idea of having uncomfortable, comfortable conversations. And listening to you, there is nobody that could be sat there thinking, this isn't for me, I can't do this, this is too uncomfortable for me. And, and I really value that kind of insight where you make it so structural, so evidenced and so rational in terms of what can we do and practical suggestions. Lots of questions that we've had come in have been addressed by your talk directly. So we wanna drill 
double down on some other issues that have been raised. So thank you so much for your insights. If I, if I can start generally on this idea of EDI, because I'm sure you've noticed amongst lots of people that EDI has become quite high on people's agendas again. Um, and for me, I don't know if this is an overall thing, when we think equality, people often associate that with gender equality. So male and female equality, equal pay, equal rights, things like that. Then when we think of um, diversity, people often think of black, white, or black and other in terms of diversity. And then when we think of inclusion, people generalist think of inclusion in terms of special educational needs, maybe inclusion within the curriculum, etc. What I wanted to ask was, how does anti-racism not get drowned out amongst generalist EDI policies? So, you know, we're touching on everything and anything, but just a little of everything. And I know intersectionality, of course, is vital, but how do we ensure that we keep this at the forefront of what's going on? I think you're right. I think you're right, Amjad. Um, and I think it's it's really important for me to say at this point, drawing on 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 something that Anna Carlyle said in a recent presentation that there is no hierarchy of inequity. You know, and I think we have our starting point has got to be that a there is no hierarchy of inequity, and once we understand it's not a competition, because if it's a competition, it is going to be a race to the bottom. You know, and that is hardly helpful. But I think I think what we really need to be to be saying is that we need to be thinking about the EDI strategy or an EDI strategy as a kind of hub. It is that strategy that links all of these different protected characteristics together, and it does so in a coherent manner. But we also need to make space for the spokes. So we have the hub and we have the spokes. And that spokes is making space for the gender equality, the race equality, the LGBTQ, the religion, the SEN, and so on and so forth. So it's really important then that we understand that, you know, this is a very complicated and problematic area around EDI, but it's not a competition. There's no hierarchy of inequity. And I think although we have this hub, which I call an EDI strategy, which brings them together, it is entirely appropriate that, that there has to be space to, to reflect on the unique issues that are affecting individual individuals or groups within an organization, regardless of those intersectionalities you mentioned. And, and I think the, the key thing here to reference is lots of us predominantly in this conversation, especially will be looking at the race element or the anti-racism work, especially as you know, that's the title of our conversation today. But it's important for us to understand, especially amongst these other areas of EDI, that just because we haven't lived that experience, that experience isn't as not important as what we're talking about. And so, yeah, you're right in terms of everybody should be looking at the plights of others, but until we lift each other up, we're constantly going to be fighting the inequality battle. And I often share the idea of if, if um, say for example, gender equality is being referenced, then we need to propel that issue and propel that need and that desire to fight the issues as opposed to then play top trumps with whose issue is greater. But Absolutely. the problem is, as you know, with George Floyd, with the movement, with the um, snowball effect that this has come, lots of people are getting impatient now and thinking, well, actually, we need something now. But I really like the fact that you've mentioned this is a long process. If we've had years and years of this not happening, we now need to build in years and years of this to happen. So I don't know if you wanted to expand on that a little in terms of how we stop. I don't know if this sounds a bit of a blunt, blunt question, but how do we stop the impatience of change? I think it's good that there is so much enthusiasm around this agenda at the moment. I think it's a kind of enthusiasm that we have never seen, certainly in, 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 in my lifetime. And I think, I think it's really important that we harness this, you know, because it, it's good and, and people want this change. People are seeing that, you know, race has played um, a, a significant and inhibiting role in the existence of humanity. 
and and over the the the, the last couple of decades, certainly in, since the 1940s in this country, race has been hugely problematic. And so I think I think you know the fact that there is so much enthusiasm around um, this this area, this the, the you know people wanting to change, wanting to to mobilize institutions and so on is a really good thing. And I, and I think it's good that people are impatient with racism because it means that this impatience will play out into more enthusiasm and more people joining this anti-racist agenda. I, my, my only note of caution would be, and I said it earlier, it's not a sprint. So how do we harness this collective endeavor, this collective enthusiasm, so that we don't waste this moment and this opportunity. And 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 just building on what you mentioned about white sanction and um, talking about your previous work, when we're looking at your framework of um, having white sanction and being initiated and engaged and all of those practices, it's important for us to note that if we are too impatient, despite the need and the desire, we might push away the collective allies that are needed in order for us to instill change. And, and, and we mention all the time that it's not just about being room it's about being given a seat at the table and it's ensuring that we could get the seat and then a voice and then move those things forward so um yeah absolutely the impatience is needed but it's like you mentioned it's strategic isn't it it's making sure that you're strategic in your movements and your endeavors rather than isolating potential support and potential changes absolutely absolutely bro um, in terms of lots of questions that have come about have been around audit frameworks and how can we build on those things and we will touch on those before we wrap up but I wanted to touch personally being a teacher being in the classroom curriculum is a big one and a couple of the questions that have come about is should we call out when curriculums are referencing say BAME authors or BAME artists or BAME specific people and my kind of response to this during Black History Month was don't cry out about there not being a need for Black History Month because it should be integrated across the year if it isn't integrated across the year. Because I personally would rather take a month than no, nothing at all. So it's that idea of how do we make it seamless, but also not the cry if it is a little bit bolt on at the moment. Is that stage one or am I just going down the wrong route here? I am with you on this one, Amjad. I think, I think you're right. Um... I think I think we make a mistake, you know, head teachers who cancel Black History Month, for example, make a mistake uh, when when we don't have a system where black history is embedded within the curricula um, for the 190 days that, that, that the young people are, are in school, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's really, really important, uh, as you say, to accept that, you know, we may be where we are now, which is the, the one month. And ideally, we, we, we would much prefer that Black history would be embedded across the whole piece. Um, but I think, I think we'd, make, we'd make a mistake if we were to, to sort of say, well, you know, if, if, I don't get the, if I don't get this a period longer than a month, then I'm not going to do anything. Or if I get the, the month is only um sort of highlighting and sedimenting existing problems in community cohesion and so on so i think i think we have to take we have to think very carefully about these mindsets one we the aspiration is to get the the um black history bma history embedded within the curricula but we're not there yet and we have to be practical we are not there yet so Again, thinking about that hub and spokes model, uh, it would be lovely to have it embedded 190 days of schooling for the year in all aspects of the curriculum. But, and that's the hub. But we will take the spokes because from the spokes, we still have an opportunity to have an influence, to share knowledges, to, to educate people, to get people to think and to reflect and so on. So I would say, you know, find ways of building out the one month and keep pressing for the kind of embeddedness within the curricula right across the year and form these alliances um, with our 
exam boards and so on, because they have a critical role to play. But I would definitely not say cancel Black History Month um, because you think it's it's going to highlight something which you're too scared to deal with, or you think um, it is actually going to be problematic for for another group or so on. I think I think that that is um, really really uh, problematic if 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 that happens. I'll just I'll jump in on that because I want to expand that out a little bit in that, um, you know, there's been a lot of focus on curriculum in schools and on what a good curriculum looks like. And I think, um, you know, when we talk about leading this work, I think there's also a place for us to place pressure on the system itself, because no matter how much you change your, your individual organisation, you're still operating within a systemic um, structure that is dictating what uh, a good curriculum looks like, what cultural capital is or should be. And I guess um, my question is about, you know, what, what the role of Ofsted is. Um, can a school be rated as good or outstanding if it doesn't have, uh, you know, British history, including people from Black and Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds that are included in that history can you know what's the role of of Ofsted and what's the role of the Department for Education that that has this curious mention of not engaging with organizations and agencies that promote divisive language victim narratives and so on like what's how would this influence a school's anti-racist strategy on the backdrop of these big organizations uh, I think I think that's helpful Penny you know we, you know, most head teachers and teachers are, are working really hard to understand the marginalizing effects of racism. And, uh, you know, some of the events in our history and in our experience as, as humanity um, may be quite upsetting, quite emotional for some people. And uh, it's just part of our shared, you know, lived experiences for where we are at this moment in time. And I, I, I've noticed the sort of inflammatory language being used by the DFE and, and it coming out of parliament and so on. And I don't think that that kind of language is helpful because that language is, it disempowers and denigrates the already marginalized and it stirs up hate. And, 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 and it's, it's, it, it really is problematic because instead of using language that empowers and liberates people who are already downtrodden, who are, who are already powerless, who are fighting against a system and a history, a century, a generation of all of these kinds of isms and schisms, then you use a kind of a divisive language around victim, victim narratives and so on, instead of tackling the problem. So the government, I think, is, 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 um, is doing a form of gaslighting, right? Mm -hmm. But in, in respect of the question you asked about Ofsted, unfortunately, inclusivity is not a measure in Ofsted's framework. So schools and colleges and teacher education departments can continue to get Ofsted outstanding without showing how, how inclusive a curricula is and without having to show inclusivity in staffing. And this is really problematic. So if, if Ofsted being the custodian of the quality of the education system can badge an organization with outstanding, um, without thinking about the inclusive nature of the curriculum, or the policies, how inclusive the policies are, um, or thinking about its ethnic profile of staff and, 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 and the community and so on, then, then schools essentially, universities, colleges, they have no incentive to do any, 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 any differently because if the government infrastructure permits them, sanctions this, then there is no incentive to change. So un unless there is a disincentive where the government says, well, you cannot get Ofsted outstanding um, unless you can demonstrate that you are offering this inclusive curriculum or you are demonstrating that your staffing pool is inclusive, racially inclusive, 
um, as well, um, it's really, really, you know, no, no incentive for the schools to do, for the organizations to do any differently than they're doing now. And as you mentioned that, Penny, I, wa I want to come back a, a little bit about this, the, the, the exam boards. They are key to this thing, the burden to diversify, to decolonize and in inclusivize the curriculum rests on the shoulders of teachers and head teachers who are already burdened. And this is not fair. Exam boards need to actively get involved in this work and their reluctance and lethargy is an antidote to the enthusiasm that is currently in the sector for this work. And so, you know, this is really problematic, but then when we have a government who who pours cold water, who threatens teachers, who threatens head teachers, and people of goodwill who wants to take this agenda forward, then you can see why, you know, unfortunately, 10 years from now, things may not have gone far as far as we would like, because the moment of the moment of momentum is being disrupted by all kinds of forces and factors which is antithetical to the kind of inclusive agenda that we are trying to pr promote um, through this moment in time. So just building on that, which is kind of tracking back to what I mentioned earlier in terms of the impatience element. Lots of people that are working in these areas will rightly be getting impatient as we mentioned. However, we're now facing a brand new resistance which is linked to a kind of opposing sanction that you mentioned there's a sanction that is actually stating it's okay to oppose this and it's okay to not think about this right now and it's okay to just do what you're doing because that's the best interest for the children and i think it's really important for us to think about how do we get around these um blockers or how do we get around these people that are motivated to make change but they're being stopped by others and i always use a phrase whenever i'm delivering training which is just to use this phrase with anybody that's blocking you can i trial this and feed it back to you and what that ha what happens with that kind of phrase is, is this idea of how can I resist that? How can I say, no, you can't trial something that will potentially better this situation for you, for I, for my students. And then you can't feed back to me about what the potential impact will be. I mean, a better, more blunt approach would be, OK, we've been doing this this way for this long. Tell me what the impact is. Tell me how you can address us repeating the ways that we've been doing things for them or if we can't say that there is a significant impact. The politer way would be, can I try this and feed it back to you? Is, it, is there any other kind of ways that people can get around blockers or get around these people that are being told, hey, this isn't on the agenda right now. We've got to deal with COVID. This is the big thing right now. And, you know, rightly, it's a global pandemic. But how do we get around those blockers? You see, thanks, thanks for that, Amjad. If we're going to create cultures of equity, then it's really important that we have this EDI anti-racism agenda being central to everything that we do. So, you know, I mentioned putting EDI slash anti-racism on performance management targets for people. That's the surest way that we can make sure that we are all singing from the same hymn sheet. If people have opt out within our organizations, then they will be blockers. But if we are saying, if you want to work here, if you want to study here, then there is a, a kind of expectation, a minimum charter. Hmm? And therefore these are the things you, you, you have to do because we want to make sure that we are accountable to our publics. We, are, we want to make sure that we are accountable to the young people, to the families and to our staff and so on. So there cannot be any opt-out um, culture. And so whilst we, there is this, um, uh, there's a lot of noise in, in, in the media and, and from elsewhere in, 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 in government and so on, I think it comes back to, to, 
to leaders and, and their own sense of agency and their own sense of integrity, mm. you know, because social justice leaders um, will challenge these, the, these, these noises and forces and, and, and actually, you know, put themselves forward and underline to, to create the, these, these kinds of um, processes because what, what they are doing, they know it's right. And it's about that moral purpose, isn't it? Um, that moral purpose that, that, that all, all head teachers talk about so much. So, you know, I think the easiest way to normalize this, this agenda is to make it a part of people's performance management targets yeah. and everybody have an EDI target. And, and I can add into that from my experience um, as a chair of governors in Haringey is that Haringey has basically said, we now have a pledge that every single school will sign up to that we will have um, black, Asian and minority ethnic children's achievement front and center of what we do. And in order to raise their achievement, we're gonna to have to adopt an anti-racist strategy because we can see from our data, our data is shocking. You know, children do really well in primary and they get into year eight and something goes wrong. And we know what that something is. It's about, you know, it's about systems and it's about uh, our bias that's really embedded in how we view in particular young black men. Um, so I think in Haringey, we just said, instead of, you know, um, tinkering around the edges, if we have a pledge that every single school in Haringey signs up to, yeah. and we share our data and we name and shame ourselves and hold our hands up and say, um, you know, this is, uh, this is, it's not going well for us. And then we're all together in trying yeah. to find the solutions to that yeah. and I think through the BAMED network we certainly saw a rush of multi-academy trusts of local authorities of kind of groups of schools coming forward and saying what do we do and how do we do it and there's also a, a whole load of um, different you know charter marks and um, uh, you know anti-racist schools award and different things that schools can sign up to so that they don't feel alone because I think if it's a member of staff in school trying to do it themselves or a lone governor trying to do it themselves or a school you know within a local authority I think it is about joining hands and holding each other to account and the other thing is um you know, making sure that it is written into the school development plan at every single level. So it's not a bolt on, it's not an additional thing. It's at every single level. It's in your, it's part of school improvement. How can your school be good if you are leaving half, exactly. of, half of the people behind? It's, it's, it's one of those things that um, my, my kind of specialism in teaching and learning is special educational needs. And I find it fascinating that when head teachers stand up at open mornings and open evenings and say, hey, we're an inclusive school. By definition, every single school should be an inclusive school. Like I wouldn't stand up in the start of a talk and say, hey, I'm an anti-sexist person. And I would like everybody to know that I believe everybody should be treated equally. So it's a wonder why we need to get to this position where it isn't seamless and it isn't integrated. I understand that we are there, but it's moving forward in those areas. Lots of people on the panel and, uh, and in the chat, Paul, have talked about this idea of how do I find out more? What do I do to find out more? And my suggestion would be, and I'd love for you to suggest uh, after, is the idea of we need to read and we need to educate ourselves and we need to find out about lived experiences and not put the burden on the people living those experiences. Because what I kind of, I've, I've done a full circle on this. I used to be like, hey, just talk to me, just ask me, just find out, ask as many things as you like. And I still am into a relative context allowing for that. But more so now I'm thinking, well, what have you done to find out about this? What are you doing to learn more about this? Would you like to just build on that? We've got a few more minutes and then we're going to wrap up. No, I think you're right, Amjad. I think um, it's important that people educate themselves and that responsibility should not sit with, uh, as you say, someone who is already living through this marginality, but but everybody needs to, to take responsibility for, for educating themselves uh, into their hands. And that may mean, you know, reading um, books, watching videos. We have um, so many things out there on YouTube and social media, but also um, there are many people like you, like me, like 
um, other than this call who are open to having conversations. And, and, and although some of that conversation will leave us feeling frustrated and angry, um, uh, um, you know, we, some of us don't mind having these conversations if we feel that these conversations are part of the greater good and are part of the solution. So I do think it's a it's a really problematic issue, and it's not it's not clear cut in terms of where you know and how the the the, the responsibility for educating society uh, or each other should 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 be managed. But I do think that people that starts with individuals, individuals, you know, trying to educate themselves and also forming these alliances and support groups and so on. But also, I think that us BME people who have had these rough and tough experiences, um, although it is really difficult for us to, to, to share some of these experiences, I think it's really important that we make space to have some of these conversations because it is only in hearing it from us um, then, then white people will really fully understand because they cannot, they, they will not understand it like that when they read it from a book or when they watch it on a cassette and so on, but having those conversations. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a thorny issue, but I think, I think there is, there is, there's going to be a multiple ways, multiple pathways of bringing this thing into, into a way, but the dialogue I think is really important. And I think that that segues quite nicely into, you know, like the purpose of the Bay Med network is that we're very purposefully um, in, inclusive of white people to join. You know, if we don't do this work hand in hand, it, it's going to be more difficult. Um, and and I can yeah. say myself, you know, we're, as a white person, I'm the person who needs to learn and to unlearn and listen and be present in this work. Um, and we have our, our website. We've just launched our new website and there's a lot of um, hopefully easier to find um, resources on there that we signpost to um, and at the end of this we, we need to wrap up now but at the end we'll share a couple of slides just directing people and in terms of um, conversation so we're hoping to hold one of these kinds of conversations every month and the next one will be about recruitment of staff and governors um, and we'll delve a little bit more deeply into that. Um, and finally, the BayMed network does have uh, regional networks and we're starting up a, a governance network as well. And we should have a SEND network and an early years network. So those will be platforms for people to have even more in-depth conversations about local issues. And, and just to add on to um, just about the BayMed network, Lots of questions have gone unanswered. We've had lots and lots of questions. So please do continue the conversation on Twitter. Um, various people will be able to respond from the Twitter handle. And also Paul Miller is on Twitter. I'm sure he'd appreciate hundreds of questions as well. <laughs> um, and so um, we'll tag him in. Um, do follow Paul um, and do continue and keep up with the work. Um, we've got a connect page on our website where we are highlighting organizations and um, individuals that are doing this work. We, we don't do the work per se, we signpost and traffic the work to people that are the experts. We provide the expertise for others to learn from in that way. So please do continue the conversation on Twitter. Um, use the hashtag catch up and do sign up for our next conversation. But from me, and I'm sure Penny, will um, thank you too it's been absolutely phenomenal yeah, thank you amazing. so much I've learned so much more I always think yeah I'm pretty good at this stuff and then I listen to people and I think no I know absolutely very minimal around this so thank you so much um, for educating me and the hundreds of others that have joined us today yeah. Thank you. And also just um, to say, Paul, you've got your uh, educational equity services where people, if people want to sign up to more focused um, seminars and um, sessions with you and with your colleagues to drill down to some of the issues, go to that website, educational equity services, um, because there's so much to learn and uh, it's, it's been brilliant having you on. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you everyone for taking part with the questions. Um, we're going to just leave up a couple of slides. You can keep chatting for a little while and we're gonna say good night. Thank, thank you. you.